because I hear this all the time. Oh, someday I'm going to write that book. I've got this idea. And someday I'm going to sit down. Don't tell me that. Mm -hmm. Tell me when you've written 30 pages. Ah. And then let's have another discussion. Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another incredible episode of For the Love of Money. I cannot wait for you to listen to today's episode because if you have ever had a book inside of you or wanted to be an author or were curious about what it's like to be a professional author, that is the discussion that we are having today along with a whole bunch of other really awesome stuff with my friend, Steve Farber. Now, You've probably heard of Steve before because he was on this show a couple of years ago. But aside from that, he is literally, and I mean literally, one of the highest regarded leadership experts in the world. He's constantly hired by the top 50 and top 100 companies in the world to come in and help them with their leadership and their culture. Now, aside from being a leadership expert, he's written four books. He's a best-selling author. His four books are Greater Than Yourself, which is one of my favorite books, The Radical Edge, The Radical Leap, and now his newest one called Love is Just Damn Good Business. How awesome of a title is that? And so we're not only going to talk about his new book, but we do a deep dive on everything that it looks like and feels like and the ups and the downs and, and just everything involved with being a professional author. And we answer the question for you, should you write a book or not? And should you attempt to be an author in this day and age or not? And I think you're going to like the answer. Now, Steve is one of these individuals in my life that I will oftentimes go and, and run some ideas by because he is such an expert when it comes to leadership and growing your business. And he has over 30 years of experience where he has seen a lot of trends. And one of the best ways to learn in life is by going to those people who have already been there, done that. And that's what we want to provide for all of you through our masterminds. Now, we are about to start enrolling in a couple of months for our top-level mastermind, our Elite Entrepreneur Mastermind. Now, to get into that mastermind, not only is there a waiting list, and we're going to we're go through that waiting list, have phone calls with everyone, and cultivate the absolute best possible room. But not only is there a waiting list, but on top of that, you must make over $500,000 to apply. And it's really meant to be that sweet spot for anybody who's between five or $600,000 in earnings up to about $3 million in earnings. If you're in that sweet spot, we're not only going to lock arms with you, we're not only going to invite all of our highest level entrepreneur friends to come do some teaching, we're not only going to lift and reveal all the secrets of what we're doing for our explosive growth, but we're also going to put together a room full of like-minded people at the same level as you that totally understand and get you. If you've ever said, am I weird for having these goals? Am I weird for working this much? You know, Why do I feel like I'm different than everybody else around me? If you've ever had those thoughts, then you're missing this exact type of tribe that we put together. And this is your chance to be a part of it. So here's what I want you to do. If you're making over $500,000 a year, and if you want to be a part of the 2020 Elite Level Mastermind, then I want you to go to forthelovemoney.com forward slash mastermind. Again, go to forthelovemoney.com forward slash mastermind. All the details are there, including the application. And the way to get on the waiting list is to fill out that application. You and I will then have a phone conversation to make sure that we are a dream fit for each other. And if we are, then you will be in that elite level mastermind room for 2020. That room has changed so many lives in so many ways, including help people make millions and millions and millions of dollars that they were not on track to make without the guidance and the tribe that we put together. So we want you to join us. If you're making over 500 grand, go to fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind, fill out the application there, and you and I will jump on the phone to make sure you're a perfect fit. I cannot wait. Now get ready because I choose to learn from experts who have already been there, done that. That's how we've had so much success. And Steve Farber is absolutely one of those gentlemen. 
So you are about to learn so much about leadership and growing and running your business that it is going to create a shift in your success. So here we go. Steve Farber, my friend, how you doing, man? How are you? You know what? I'm great. You know, you and I were joking offline. It's been too long. Uh, I think last time I saw you was when I buzzed down there for lunch. And, and a lot of people that are new to the show, they probably don't realize they can go back in the archives about, what is it, a year and a half ago and catch an episode maybe, that you and I maybe did. Maybe more. Yeah. Maybe more. I, I, my default is always five years. Every whatever fi- it is. Every Friday. Yeah. Whatever it is, it must have been five years ago. <laughs> right. Exactly right. I love it. Well, here, tell you what, one thing that's different since the last time you and I did a show together... Um, I do rapid fire up front now. It's kind of a fun way to help my listeners get to know you in a hurry. And then if something really good comes up, we'll circle back around and do a deep dive on it. How's that sound? Okay, to you? cool. All right, good. Awesome. Good. I and, didn't study for this. Hey, you don't have to because okay. I'm going to start real easy. Ready? Okay, good. Where'd you yeah. grow up? Chicago. And where do you live now? I live in San Diego. Man, there's something about a Midwest person that comes out to California. I got to like those people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite quote? There are many people who think they want to be matadors only to find themselves in the ring with 2,000 pounds of bull bearing down on them and then discover that what they really wanted was to wear tight pants and hear the crowd roar. (laughs) Is that a real freaking quote? It is a real freaking quote from my my friend and mentor, Terry Pierce. Oh my God, I love it. I'm now having flashbacks to why I love interviewing you because it's so entertaining. (laughs) What is one of your superpowers? I do. I do inspire flashbacks, but <laughs> I've, not, I've noticed that um, one of my superpowers is to take complex ideas and make them simple. Ah, oh, that's valuable. What's one of your favorite books outside of one of your four best-selling books? I read the Tolkien trilogy in my lifetime, probably fifteen times. Wow. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I just you know I started first time I read it I was actually in in uh, middle school or junior high, as we called it in Chicago. And I was so absorbed by that world, I just wanted to go back to it again and again. Mm. So if that's, my, if that's my sole criterion, which I think is a good one, how many times have you read a particular book? Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd have to say that that's, that, that's still, that still holds it. That's really cool. I haven't read it 15 times, but one of the books that's similar like that to me, where every year I go back to it, is Tuesdays with Maury. Oh, yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. All right. A couple more here. Um, What's one thing you're challenged by right now? Growth. Scale. In what ways? Well, we are... uh, You know, I've got a company called the Extreme Leadership Institute. And I I think it's fair to say it's a 20-year-old startup. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Isn't it always? Yeah. Yeah. So it's that, you know, we've got really great clients. We're doing phenomenal work. We're helping companies to apply the ideas that that we're going to be talking about here to extraordinary results, mm. amazing turnarounds, phenomenal growth. And of course, the irony is it's growth for, for everybody else. For us, it's about finding the right mix of people mm. and expanding my personal and, our, and my partner's bandwidth. Yeah. So that's, I'd say that's the biggest challenge right now. It's a good challenge to have. It's, it's funny because I always say the toughest part of business is, quote, finding your people. And, and yeah. when you can find your team and build your team, man, everything falls into place. But it, it's, I think, the toughest part is getting that part right. Yeah. All right. A couple more. Uh, one thing that you've done recently that is generous. I devote my time in a lot of ways, but particularly on the platform to uh, educators. Uh, so, for example, just recently, I spoke at the kickoff of the Encinitas uh, Union School District uh, for, for all of the teachers. And I devote my time to helping educators, particularly in the San Diego area, to operationalize love in the way that they teach. Mm, I love that. Good for you. And last but not least, what are you grateful for today? Well, aside from the obvious, grateful for my friendships, mm. which is where this conversation has, has come from. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it's the best. Like putting together that tribe of people that you know you, know you can count on or that, that you enjoy being around or you're inspired by. You know, Chris, I have... I have phenomenal friends Mm -hmm. all over the world. And I think a big part of it is because of the way that I do business, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's business business all the time. And my business is my body of work. So there's no line at all, virtually no line uh, between so-called work and so-called other. Mm -hmm. Um, It's all one to me. So some of my best friends, I mean, and I'm not exaggerating, I started out as clients. Wow. 
uh, or colleagues. Wow. And, and it's really quite an interesting spectrum of people. Uh, so, you know, we do an event every year, an annual event called the Extreme Leadership Experience. And I invite a lot of those friends who are in the, the kind of the speaker and expert category mm -hmm. to come. And just to give you an idea, uh, this next one is coming up in, in February, last weekend in February. Mm -hmm. And one of the speakers is Barry Rassen, who is the immediate past president of Rotary International. Oh, wow. And another of the speakers is Sandra Joseph, who is the longest running Christine in Phantom of the Opera on really? Broadway. That's cool. Yeah, she's actually the longest running leading lady in Broadway history. That's amazing. These people are both friends of mine, is, is my point. So I'm very grateful for my friends, both near and far. That's cool. That's a great way to, to wrap up the rapid fire with a, on a positive note. And, and so now here's what I want to do. I want to get a little bit deeper into some more meaningful stuff. Although, how do you say it gets more meaningful than building good friendships? But would you please give a refresher to all the new people who have joined this show since the last time you and I chatted as to how you have become, and these are not my words, these are a lot of people's words, one of the ultimate extreme leadership experts in the world today? Well, thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a question to live up to, man. <laughs> so I'll give you the, the very high level. I've been at this work in some form or another for three decades. Uh, so this was not an overnight thing. It was an iterative and, and uh, long process of having exposure to some really phenomenal mentors and amazing clients. So I can count among my clients just about every kind of industry, just about every kind of company that you can think of. So I've, I've really been blessed with having a very broad perspective mm -hmm. uh, by getting exposure to all of these different uh, markets and companies and places around the world with a focus on what makes for great leadership. So when you have enough input like that, including the input from my mentors' bodies of work, uh, it was just kind of a natural thing. And it, and it goes back, I think, to the, the superpower that, that I mentioned earlier. I've always had an ability to take other people's ideas and synthesize them and put them in a, in a format that, are, that's, that makes them really accessible mm -hmm. to other people. Uh, so after having worked with other people's bodies of work for so long, it was just a natural step for me to begin to ask myself, what do I think about all this? What's, what's my point of view on this? And in trying to answer that question, I wrote my first book in 2004 called The Radical Leap. Uh, that was Great followed book, up. by the way. Thank you. Thank you. That was followed up by The Radical Edge and then by Greater Than Yourself, which I know you've also, yep. you've also read. And I think we talked about last time. And, and, and although all three books are really good, The Radical Leap and greater than yourself are, are my two favorites out of that batch. Yeah, thank you. And then, of course, the most recent one is "Love is just damn good business." Yeah, we're going to get which is the culmination of it's the culmination of it. So it's been a long, it's been a long, long journey, Chris. <laughs> um, but I love, I love, and that's the key word: communicating these ideas, helping people to apply them. And you know, I do a lot of speaking. I do, you know, we have our consulting company, like I mentioned. And this, it's just a great joy in my life to do this stuff. I love that. So I've got a question for you on behalf of so many people listening that consider writing books or consider being authors. You know, the, the world of being a professional author has changed a lot over the last yeah. several years, oh, I'd yeah. imagine. So to people that are listening and they say, hey, I think I have a book in me. Or, hey, I think I want to be an author. Or I think I want to make money by writing books. What kind of advice do you have for them? This is going to sound very simplistic because as you can imagine, I hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. And the simple answer is write. Mm. Write. You have to, books don't emerge in some in some miraculous way. Uh, they don't, and there are some people among us who just sit down and barf it all out, and that's fantastic. They can't hold themselves back. It's like this this geyser that can't be stopped. For the rest of us, it's sitting down at whatever medium works best for you, keyboard, pen and paper, whatever, and just freaking write. You know, I because I hear this all the time. Oh, someday I'm going to write that book. I've got this idea, and someday I'm going to sit down. Don't tell me that. Mm -hmm. Tell me when you've written 30 pages. Ah. And then let's have another discussion. Because that's what writing is. Uh, I actually mentioned this in, in the new book, in the introduction there. It's an, old, it's an old quote. It's been attributed to different people. The act of writing 
is like sitting at sitting down at the keyboard and staring at the screen until blood breaks out on your forehead. <laughs> I love that. It, it's not particularly glamorous, but if you don't do the work, it's never going to happen. So to all these aspiring authors out there that have a book in them, one of the things that gets talked about a lot is, is it profitable to write a book? You've made a heck of a career out of being a real author. And I feel like there's these two categories. There's real career authors, and then there's everybody else that are writing books for whatever agenda. Sure. Um, and neither one is good or bad, right? It's, it's just whichever yes. category you fall into. Yes. Would you write so, a book in hopes of making a profit, or does there need to be other reasons to write a book? So first of all, to answer the second part of that question first, no, there doesn't need to be... Uh, the. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Yes, there needs to be other reasons. That shouldn't be the only reason that you write a book. You write a book first and foremost because you have something to say. Mm -hmm. And you have some wisdom to impart. You have some perspective that you want to share. You have a voice that you want to give expression to. Uh, and is it is it possible to make money writing a book? Is that a good strategy? Profit from the book? Yes, and I don't mean this to sound... Again, cynical, but it's it's about as good of a strategy for making money as winning the lottery. Ah, uh, and here's what I mean by that: there are so few books in the millions, you know, the the millions of books universe that make a lot of money through the sale of that book. Mm -hmm. It's very very few. It's possible, just like it's possible to win the lottery and to to you know, beat this metaphor to death, uh, you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. You can't have a best-selling book unless you write it. So mm -hmm. we're back to that. But, but that's not the only reason to write the book. So here's another question. Is it possible to leverage your book to make significant money in other ways oh. that is served by the existence of that book? And that is a resounding yes. So the book plays um, a different role. It's not write book, make dollar. It's more yeah. like write book, get street cred, change lives, program appears, and it's like a secondary later on income stream. Yes. So if you're writing... Now, I have a bias. When I think about writing books, I, I think I go right to you know business books. And I know there are other kinds of books out there. Like, mm -hmm. for example, The Lord of the Rings was not a business no. book. I mean, I get that, right? <clears throat> but, but so let's take it category by category. In, in writing business books... Uh, if it's related to your business as a speaker, as a coach, as a consultant, as a seminar giver, as a whatever, then that becomes your your best business card. Mm -hmm. And of course, the better the book does, the better it's going to help your business. The more it's going to help your business. But I had you know back when I was first starting to get out there on the speaker circuit, and this was back in in the late '90s, actually, um, an owner of the speakers bureau said to me. This is before my first book came out. He said, and I quote, I can't overestimate the importance of a book. You have to have a book. And then he went on to say, it doesn't have to be a good book, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to have a book. Now, having a good book is, is a lot better of an alternative. Now, that's one category. If you're more in the creative expression category and you have a novel inside of you, um, then that's not necessarily going to uh, you know, benefit your income in some other way, unless you're, I mean, you can get creative with that. Maybe it's teaching, writing workshops, maybe, I don't know what it is, but to, to write, to write the great American novel mm -hmm. is a pursuit worth going after whether or not the book ever sells even one copy, mm. because what it will do for you, for your clarity of thought, for your creative expression, you can't put a price on that. Yeah. Boy, that's true. You're going to grow. The way I often teach people that build that business for who you're going to have to become to grow that business, you're almost saying the same thing. Like Write that book for who you're going to have to become in order to finish it and get it out there. Yeah. So the other thing that just occurs to me, I mean, in this moment, I haven't thought about it this way before. If you're thinking that you need to write a book for your business, you're going to have... I predict maybe a harder time in writing that book than I have a book in me. I have an idea that I want to express. Mm -hmm. So if that's where you're coming from, you already have a good leg up. You already have a pretty good advantage. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to write a book just for your business, go and hire a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. That's another possibility. 
There's nothing that says that you have to sit down and write it word for word. You sit down with a ghostwriter, it's going to cost you money. Sit down with a ghostwriter and just, you know, just say what you have to say. And their job is to craft it and mold it into a readable book. Yeah. One more question I get a lot from all the people that are listening. Regardless of the reason that they're writing their book, should they go with a publisher or self-publish? Yeah, that's a great question. Especially with how quickly um, the world's changing right now, right? Do I keep saying that's a great question? Because you keep asking <laughs> great questions. I'll take it. <laughs> it's like, did, have you ever had a guest on your show that said, well, that's a stupid question? No, but I think, I think I would actually sit there in shock. Like, wow. <laughs> I'll try that before we're done. Um, so in, in today's writing um, and publishing landscape, it's easier than ever to self-publish. Mm -hmm. And the mainstream publishing world has become fiercely competitive. And it used to be that the reason you would go with a mainstream publisher is because you know you, you would pitch them the idea, give them a sample and a, and, a, and a book proposal. And if they like it, they would pay you in advance. And then you go and finish the book. Advances are hard, much harder to come by nowadays. And much smaller than people think now. And days. much smaller, much smaller. So if you have the, uh, but here's the advantage. The reason that I went with a mainstream publisher for Love is Just Damn Good Business, and it's McGraw Hill, mm -hmm. right? So have you heard of McGraw Hill? Oh, yeah, big name. So that's why I went with McGraw Hill mm -hmm. because everybody's heard of McGraw Hill. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's, it's important on the, on the credibility piece because, you know, I get hired to speak at companies mm -hmm. and conferences. And if I say, oh, I got a new book, and they go, oh, really? You know, who published it? I, I did. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, for that purpose, it's not as effective, right? Ah. Because anybody can do it. There's no barrier to entry. But if you're, if you're with a mainstream publisher, what it says is, this book is good enough to have been published by a mainstream publisher. Mm. These ideas are sound enough. So therefore, maybe I should consider hiring this person to speak, right? Yeah. So it really depends. It depends on what your objective is. If, again, if you're if you're using it as as a, like a a really great business card kind of approach to give to prospects and clients on you know for consulting and and that kind of a thing, and and that doesn't really matter so much to you, then self publish by all means. You just have to make sure that if you go that route. It gets back to what we were talking about earlier. You got to get the right people. Mm -hmm. And the right people in this case are you, you have to have a really kick ass editor. Uh, you have to have at least one, maybe two pairs of eyes other than your own who are going through that thing with a fine tooth comb, one for content, mm -hmm. which is a content editor, somebody that's going to look at, at, as it implies, the content, but also the flow and the structure of the book. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a copy editor is the one who's going through it word by word, line by line to correct the punctuation of the formatting and all of that. So the, the death knell is if you publish it yourself and, and it, the, the reader looks at it and says, well, this is, this is like they printed it in their office. I've you know, seen books like that, that where I've, yeah. I've been reading and it's okay once in a great while for a typo to sneak through, but where it seems like there's one every five pages. And, and what happens is you become distracted as a reader. That's right. You get thrown off affects, as a reader. It affects the credibility of the writer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't, if you can't, if you don't, the, don't know the difference between your and your, mm -hmm. as in you are and you and possessive, there and there, then, <laughs> then yeah, and then. See. Oh my god, it drives me crazy. I know we see that a lot in social media, right? But mm -hmm. but in in a book, you you have to be meticulous about that, which again means you know you have to invest, right? So the other the other uh, analysis when you put them up against each other is in a self published book. You're going to pay for everything, and you're going to keep most everything mm. that you make. Yeah. With a uh, mainstream publisher, they they're going to pay you in advance, hopefully, uh, and then they produce the book, they pay for it, they get distribution on it, and you get paid a percentage mm -hmm. of your own book. So it, that also depends on what your business model is. So for me, you know, the Radical Leap and the Radical Edge, my first two books were originally published by a publisher called Dearborn back in 2004 and 2006. They don't exist anymore. And it's a long story, Chris. But <laughs> the bottom line was, I ended up getting the rights back to those two books. Okay. So we published it. I partnered with a guy who got me great distribution on the book. We, we created an imprint called Mission Boulevard Press and Digital. And we published that book ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and we actually make money on those books. Mm-hmm. Not enough to retire on, but mm-hmm. you know, when I'm making you know 15 bucks a book versus a couple of bucks, yeah. it, that adds up pretty quick. Yep. So it's all you have to you have to look at what your objectives are, and then and then plan your your route accordingly. It's interesting that you mentioned the numbers. Uh, caveat: Everyone's going to work their own deal, but. Here's what we learned. When Lori published her book last year, we went with a big name publisher, Simon & Schuster. Mm -hmm. And you nailed it when you said, you're really deciding between the difference of, do you want to put all the money out front yourself and keep a large chunk of that book when you self-publish? Or do you want to get a big advance or an advance and um, then keep very little of each book sold? And of course, we went with Simon & Schuster. So we get like, I think it's 2% of the cover of every Mm -hmm. sale or might be 2.5%. I'd have to go look at that. So it's like a... I'm sorry, seven and a half percent. Sorry, so it's like yeah, a measly. Yeah, that sounded a little. Yeah, low. sorry, seven and a half percent. So it's like a measly two dollars or two fifty on every single book sold. It takes a long time to make your advance back if you get a yes. big advance before you're yes. even seeing any royalties. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. And then the other thing, the the classic first time author mistake is you you believe that the the reason to go with the mainstream publisher is because they're going to sell your book. Oh, yes. Thank you not. for touching on this. This is important yeah. for the would-be authors listening. They do nothing to market your book. They do nothing. Zero. I mean, literally, this was one of the biggest wake-up calls. Zero. We had to yeah. come up with a marketing, marketing plan. We had to fund the book tour. We had to fund the marketing. We had to fund the Facebook ads. We had to fund the graphic arts. We had to do all of it. They literally yeah. get your book on shelves and that's where their responsibility ends. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's no small thing, Mm -hmm. but it's not because it's hard, it's hard to get distribution. It's hard to get into, um, you know, Barnes and Noble, for example, nowadays, but you know, that's it. That's as far as it goes. And maybe they'll have, I mean, they'll likely have somebody internally who's, who's called PR, who, who will write an article on the publisher's blog, Mm -hmm. put a couple of things on their social media platforms. And that's what they call PR. And you know books don't sell that way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have to be prepared. Uh, whether you self-publish or go with or go with a mainstream publisher, it's your job to sell it. Mm, I love this. And conversation. therefore, there's, so there's one other thing. This is another reason why why the marketplace is getting the the traditional mainstream publishing uh, is harder to break into because what they look for, what publishers look for more than anything else nowadays. They, they, I mean, obviously they want a good idea and and all of that. But they want to know what your platform is. Mm-hmm. So how many... And, and by that, and it's easy to count nowadays, how many views on YouTube, how many people in your social media network, how big is your list? You know? And so for me, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I've sold a couple of hundred thousand books over the years. Uh, pretty well known in the industry. I went to my publisher who published Greater Than Yourself. And when, I, when this new book... We had this new book. Uh, this new book idea that we were shopping around. And I went to my my editor, who's a great guy, and he loves Greater Than Yourself. It's one of his favorite books. And he said, he read my proposal. He said, I love this. I think it's great. I can't publish it. Whoa. And I said, you know, so t- tell me why. And he said, because now they're in a, they're an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House, okay. right? So for he people said, listening, we, that means like a mini business within a big business. Yeah, yeah. It's a small, it's part of Penguin Random House, but they have their own name, their own team and all that. He said, we're only publishing, in this imprint, we're only publishing 15 books a year. So we're publishing authors that have huge platforms. And he said, by that, I mean a million views mm-hmm. on YouTube, a million followers on Instagram. And he says, so as much as I love this, I can't publish it. That's funny. And, we had that happen to us. Sorry to cut you off, but people really need to understand this, this author game out there. Lori, who had... At the time, I think she only had like 125,000 Instagram followers. She has about a quarter million now. Uh, she had 175,000 people on her mailing list. She had you know, what we thought were pretty good numbers. They are great numbers. And our very first call, talk about getting deflated, but continuing on anyways. Our very first call with the publisher... They didn't ask what the book is about. They didn't say, <laughs> they, they didn't care. They said, so tell me about your platforms. And she's like, my platform? She's like, and they said, yep. Tell me about you know, your mailing list, your, your Facebook followers, your Instagram followers, all that stuff. That's how they open the conversation now. And she told yeah. them. And I remember it was, it was this guy who was on speakerphone. And he said, oh, oh, well, 
Well, that's a good start in this really condescending way, but yeah. we only work with people that have a million followers or more on either Facebook or Instagram. So uh, we're going to go ahead and pass on this one. And, and thanks for setting up the call. And they hung up. This call was five minutes long. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Right. Yeah. She was really uh, brokenhearted, but then you know pulled up her bootstraps and went and found a good deal. Yeah. And uh, that is that is the nature of the world. But not all publishers have that same level of, of criteria. So McGraw-Hill, obviously, is, that's not as important to them. Uh, what was more important to them was, is this, is this a viable idea? Is this going to fit in with our offerings? You know, and they're, they're always asking the question, can the author sell it? Yeah. It's, uh, it, it is a business. And it's a very, when you look at mainstream publishing, it is quite an antiquated business at mm -hmm. that. So there's a lot to be said for self-publishing, particularly if you have a list of 175,000 people, you'll make money on your book. Mm -hmm. No question about it. Yep. D depending on the engagement, of course, that you have with your with your list. So there's lots of things to consider. We were but shocked I really think how it hard it was with, to sell a book. Yeah, it's it it, it is. It's it, it's harder it, than it's people perfect. think. Yeah, it's it perfect. really is. Do you have? A, let me ask you this. Um, and yeah. I'm loving this conversation about you know from a such a successful professional author's standpoint. We've never ha really had this conversation on the show before. So. Um, You've just written your fourth book, and I can't wait to dive into that conversation in, in a minute here. But you've just written your fourth book. Do you have another book in you? Because they don't, they seem to only come out maybe every five years or something. Correct me on the number if I'm wrong. And if you do, five years from now, 10 years from now, you just referenced how quickly the, the world and the industry is changing. Is printing and, and writing traditional books still going to be a thing? Yeah. So, yes, I do have uh, more books in me. And by the way, it's been 10 years. Oh, geez. Yeah, it's been 10 years. We've done, we've done newer editions of the first three books. Mm -hmm. So we did a new edition for, for Greater Than Yourself. We did a couple of different editions of Leap and Edge. Uh, but this is my first new book in 10 years, which is inexcusable, mm -hmm. uh, really, if I was lecturing myself, <laughs> which I am, apparently. So five years from now, there's, there's an interesting counterintuitive trend that's happening right now. Uh, books, as in tangible physical books, are still popular. Mm -hmm. You know, a number of years ago, we think, well, books are going to be a thing of the past. It's all going to be Kindle or, 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 or the like. But people still like to have something they can hold in their hands. Mm -hmm. They may buy the book just to have it or to have the author sign it or to, or, or to, you know, to add to their collection and put on their shelf because it looks nice. And then they'll go and listen to it on Audible, which is mm -hmm. fine. And that's the other trend is that audiobooks are becoming more and more popular uh, for the same reason that podcasts are becoming more and more popular. Because to, to paraphrase Gary V, I think he said that you know, he's, he's really bullish on sound, mm -hmm. the way he put it, uh, because of all the media, that's the most respectful of a person's time. Yeah. In other words, I can do other things while I listen to this. You can run, you can work out, you can drive. You can't do that watching YouTube. That's right. Or, or reading a book. It's a, it's a lot harder to do. I mean, you, without bumping into shit. You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is fine if you want to try it. I've seen it happen. So the thing is that, you know, five years from now, I predict that books are still going to be really important. It's still going to be the, you know, one of the critical ways that we spread ideas, that we, that we start conversations. What a really great book does is it's, it adds to and builds on a conversation that's already going on mm -hmm. and maybe takes it in a, in a different direction. But it's not about you know, coming up with an idea that's entirely brand new that nobody's ever thought about before. That they're, they're just... I mean, every so often, something like that comes along. But as human beings, we talk to each other. We exchange ideas. We, we compare experiences. And books will remain a big part of that of that society-wide, global, actually, conversation. Mm, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. There's something nostalgic about holding a book or giving a book or recommending a book. When I wake up in the morning, I don't want to put a book on audio in my ears. I want to hold a book and look at the pages while I have my coffee. I don't know if that's because I'm 41 years old and maybe someone who's listening who's 20 is like, not me, dude. I want to pop it in my ears right away. Who knows? But... I see five years from now, books still tangible books still being a very big, playing a very big important role. And, yeah. and so, if you got one inside you, definitely keep writing. Absolutely. So you've written four books now, and the first three were parables. Yes. And I love a good parable. Here's why: 
you feel like you're getting lost in a movie, kind of the way it reads, the way it's told. You feel like you're getting lost in a movie and, and the character development is amazing. And then you end up learning some kind of lesson or lessons at the end of this thing as you go mm-hmm. through this journey. But this fourth book is not a parable. This fourth, And I love the title, by the way. Love is just damn good business. It's not a parable. Tell me what made you switch from writing parables to now this perspective of a book. Yeah, so it's a bit of an experiment for me. The parables are are wonderful uh, on a couple of levels. You know, like you said, it's a good it's a it's a delivery system basically, right? It's like taking the medicine in a in a in a way that's really fun and entertaining in a gummy bear and, instead of in in the spoon <laughs> full of the weird tasting stuff. <laughs> right. In a in a gummy bear versus a, a bong hit. <laughs> well, that's, that's different so, medicine, but that's we're too. in California. That we're too, in California. Yeah. You say gummy bears in California, it means something different. Uh, I knew that's what you were thinking as soon as I said <laughs> that. Um, so so the uh, uh, the parable. I'll qualify what you said. Yes, it's very powerful when it's done well. When it's not done well, it's distracting. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like this is a stupid story, and 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 it's clunky, and the dialogue doesn't sound realistic. And mm. there are some parables that I've read that I really like, and some it's like it, it comes across as like a really bad training video, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, so so yes, when it's done well, it's really great for me personally. Um, the first three books were were a combination of getting ideas out and also an act of creative expression. You know, we were talking about novelists before. It was my chance to be a novelist in a way that was congruent. And made sense for the, my business, mm-hmm. right? So I really, I love that and I will do it again. I, th- I think that my next book will probably be a parable. But I also thought it was time for me to write this idea. I wanted to write this idea in, a, in the format of something that we consider to be a bit more traditional. And the reason is, well, for one thing, I just wanted to try it. And for another, you'd be surprised when you're trying to get PR on a book, mm-hmm. you'd be surprised how many people, how many outlets... Um, media outlets, et cetera, will dismiss it out of hand if it's a parable. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because they disinterpret it as not, it's not heavy duty enough. So I wanted to reach a, a, a different market because the title is so provocative mm-hmm. that I was afraid that if I said, you know, love is just damn good business, then people started reading it and they're reading a story, then it's kind of a compound um, dismissal out of hand before really exploring it. That oh this is this you know soft California touchy feely hoo ha yeah. crowd, um, so I wanted it to be based you know heavily uh, you know containing a lot of real time case studies stories examples of people and individuals I guess people are individuals uh, and companies who have been operationalizing love as a business practice and telling their stories as a way to illustrate what. I hope the reader will go and do in their business, right? So there was a strategic reason for writing it this way. The ideas that I have for the next book is it's got parable written all over it. Okay, so this makes good sense why you released this one in the way that you did. Love is just damn good business. You've been a leadership expert for 30 years. You've been a business expert for 30 years consulting some of the biggest Fortune 100 companies. I feel like love has always been the way that you should do business. But... Let's be honest, it hasn't, it hasn't been common practice. So why this book right now? Yeah, for that very reason. So let's be really clear. I didn't make this up. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sitting in, a, in the proverbial ivory tower and saying, okay, what's something that we've never talked about <laughs> before and that I'm not sure works or not? Love, there, that's, let's do that. This is based on a lot of observation over a lot of decades now with a lot of companies and a lot of people seeing this put into practice every day. And you're right. We don't typically talk about it this way. We simply don't call it what it is. And unless I've seen this happen many times in private or in or not even in private, just casual conversation, start listening for it, Chris. Mm-hmm. How often do you hear people use that word in, in, in relation to their business? It's a lot. Yeah. So I'll sit down with the senior executive and say, oh, tell me about your team. Oh, I love them. My team is fantastic. How, tell me about this company. I love this company. This is great. We're doing this and that and the other thing. I love this. I love that. I love him. Love her. Love this. Love, 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 love. And then I can ask that same question of that same person in a public format. Mm. And that word evaporates. Interesting. Tell me about your team. Oh, they're great. 
<laughs> I wonder why that is. So why, when you're sitting down intimately, they're like, I love my team, I love my business, I love it. But let's say you're in a very public forum, maybe you're doing a QA and a in front of a crowd of a thousand people. Why does yeah. that word disappear? I think it's uh, there's a collective conditioning that leads us to believe and a lot of it, you know, we can get into the whole history of, you know, starting with the Industrial Revolution, probably, mm-hmm. where we treated business as, uh, as some kind of uh, assembly line, right? Mm-hmm. Which was great when they were assembly lines just making stuff. Actually, it wasn't even so great then. Uh, but then we started to treat people the, way, the same way that we did machines. And I think there is, there is a, a, a very strong residue of that mm-hmm. uh, in the way that we think about business and the way that we approach it. And it's something that we buy into collectively. So I can't prove what I'm about to say, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. I just can't prove it. I believe that most people already believe that love is just damn good business. Mm -hmm. I would agree. But most people believe that most people don't believe that. Mm. So we don't... Whoa, I really want to unpack that. That's good. Most people believe, and they would tell you, yeah, of course, love is good business, but they don't believe that other people believe that. Yeah. yeah. They're, you, know, and, well, you know why? Probably because they're not seeing it in execution. And, and it's, not part of, it's not part of our conversation. And again, we have that history that says love is soft, love is weak, love is, love is for, you know, for sissies. Mm-hmm. Business is all about, it's all about the, the results in the bottom line. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we tend to make those two things mutually exclusive. That either business is about love and having people be engaged, or it's about making money. Mm. And what I'm laying out, I hope pretty clearly in this book, is that they are not mutually exclusive. That in fact, operationalizing love in the way that we do business is what can make us more money. Mm. It's what makes us more successful, more profitable. It's not an either or choice. In fact, I think, I think it's an imperative. And so here's, here's what happens. I've, this is what I've seen and why I came to the conclusion that I did. Over the years, and I've been writing about this for a long time, LEAP is Love, Energy, Audacity, and Proof. That's what LEAP stands for. So 2004, that book came out, right? And I've been teaching this and helping people to work with it for however long 2004 was ago. <laughs> right? It still sounds like a new car to me. Isn't that funny how you get programmed, by the way? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so this is not a, it's not a new idea. Uh, so over the years, this is what I've heard from many, many people. Either they come up to me after a speech or they send me an email after reading a book or say, whatever. And they say something like this. I'm really grateful that you're using this language and you're talking about this because that's the way I've always felt. And I thought there was something wrong with me until I heard you say it. Mm. So what that led me to, to understand, Chris, is that this book and my business is not about convincing anybody of anything. I'm not in the convincing business. I'm in the confirmation business. Oh. So I'm looking for the people that are already, their instinct is already there. The impulse is already there. They're just, they're looking for a way to, to make that more manifest. And they're looking for evidence that, that they should. Otherwise, we kind of relegate it to the dark corners of business. So, uh, so I got to ask you, you've spent 30 years working with businesses. Have you seen a specific example where a company has adopted true, actual love as one of its core executionable values and therefore seen a direct ROI from it? Oh, yeah. Can you give us Yeah, that? and in fact, yeah. So I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll give you my favorite example. Uh, and I, I write about it in the book. We have several case studies like this in the book, both of organizations and individuals. So there's a company, I love this example because they show how, how with, when you get intentional about love as a business principle, uh, you, can, you can really create a new reality and they show it in an industry that is not particularly sexy. What's that? Right? So it, it's, a, it's a company called Trailer Bridge. They're in Jacksonville, Florida. Check them out. Look them up. They are a shipping company. Hmm. Right? So they ship stuff from primarily from mainland U.S. to Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. Okay. They've been in business for, I think, around 28 years now. Now, if you look at their history, these guys were... And, and they would tell you this themselves, so I'm not speaking out of school. They were toxic. 
Mm. It was a miserable place. People hated working there. Customers did business with them only because they were cheap. Mm. Was uh, it very masculine? And, was it very just like I picture a shipping company would be just very cold and masculine? Yeah, I don't, I don't know about, about masculine per se, but just kind of lifeless. Mm-hmm. And, and it showed up in their performance. In fact, they went bankrupt. Wow. Uh, so as they emerged from bankruptcy, they burned through four CEOs in three years. Mm-hmm. They burned through four heads of HR in the same period of time. Uh, people were dying to get out of there. They just, they just couldn't, they just couldn't make it happen. And then they tapped one of the the guys who was on the senior management team at the time. The board asked him to take over. His name is Mitch Luciano, mm-hmm. and he said, "Okay." I will, I will take, take on the turnaround of this company. I'm going to build it into something extraordinary. Uh, but there's, there are a couple of conditions. Number one, I will not take the title of CEO. Because we just, <laughs> we've just we been through like the CEO of the month. Yeah, that's recently. interesting. He said, I have to earn that title. Oh. So you can call me president for now. I'll earn the title of CEO. And then he said... To the board, who's a very, you know, like a private equity, you know, uh, you know, really bottom line oriented kind of folks. He said, I'm just going to warn you that, that, you know, I'm, I don't know that he used these words exactly, but the message was, I'm a love guy. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn this around and do things that you might not have expected me to do. So as it turns out, Mitch was, um, he was a big fan of my first three books. Oh, cool. And now, now keep in mind, I had not yet met him. Okay. Okay. But he was, a, he, he was one of these guys that said, oh, yeah, that is right. It was a confirmation of who he already was. Mm-hmm. So he said, I'm going to apply love as a business practice in this turnaround. So here's what he did. This is what it looks like. Okay, He did, actually, he and his team, he'd be the first to tell you it wasn't him. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. It was his team. Another sign of a good leader. But let's, yeah, but let's be clear. It started with him. Mm-hmm. Right? He said, I have to prove to the people that work here that I love them, that I believe in them, that we can do this. And I have to create an environment that people are going to love working in. Now think about where they were at the time. Mm-hmm. People did not love working there. No. They hated working. Toxic. There. So I'm going to, I'm going to make this a place that people love. So he, so he got right into the weeds. He said, okay, what would that look like? So if people loved working here, what would happen? What would the dynamics be like among the employees? So, well, for one thing, we would know each other. We would know who we're working with. We would know each other's stories, right? That's what mm-hmm. you do when, when, when you have a great relationship at work. You take you, interest in each other. Exactly. So he looked at the way they've been doing business and he said, okay, look, we're 120 people is what they were at the time. Everybody wore name tags at that time. Huh. So he said, no more name tags. He banned the name tags. Smart. Because he said, you know, at least we should know each other's names. That's a good starting place, Mm -hmm. which meant that he had to learn everybody's name in that company himself, right? Mm -hmm. So it started with something as simple as that. Then he looked at the physical environment. He said, okay, how would this environment be different? The the layout, the offices, the the furniture, all this. If if people really loved working together, what would this place be like? So he put in, you know, a couple of new, like common areas with, you know, the, the now requisite foosball tables and ping pong tables and all that. And then once a week, they bring in a, a different food truck every week, park it outside the, outside the office building, and everybody gets together for lunch. You know, it was that sort of a thing to, to begin to foster those relationships. And at the same time, he was very overt in what he was doing. He said, I want this to be a place that, that we love working in. Okay? So what he's doing, just to be really clear, and, and I want everybody to understand this, whatever your business is, the question that we have to answer is, what should... If we really love this place, love the people, love the customers, what should what would we be doing if that were really true? Mm-hmm. What would we do differently to make that more true or to, to really prove that, that that is true? Lots of ways to ask it. Mm-hmm. So that's essentially what, what he was asking. And then they looked at, for example, and by the way, I'm, this is, believe it or not, the short version of the story because <laughs> they've done hundreds of things. So they looked at their customers, okay? Mm-hmm. So let's say you're a customer of Trailer Bridge. You're because you're shipping a car to your family in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. right? It's going mm-hmm. on this container. It's going to leave Jacksonville, cross the pond, cross that part of the pond, 
and arrive in Puerto Rico, your family's going to pick it up at the dock there. That's the that's their business. And you tell your family that car is going to be there on a particular date. Well, they had a policy back then that said, unless that container is at least 75% full, we won't sail. Because if we sail at less than 75% full, we're going to lose money on that shipment. And we're a business. Seems like a very common policy. It reminds me of like airlines or something like that. So it seems like a common policy. Yeah. So they asked this question. Oh, and by the way, their customer service scores were terrible. Mm -hmm. Is what I said earlier. People, they were discount chipper. Because that was the only way they can get customers is by being cheaper. So they asked the question. If we really loved our customers, what would we do if that container was less than 75% full? And when you ask the question that way, the answer is pretty obvious. You'd ship the car. That's right. We sail. We sail. That became the new policy. We sail no matter what. And so did they lose money on that particular ship then at first when they started sailing? Yeah. Yeah. But let's let's get to the punchline. Okay? Here's the punchline. Where they are now. Uh, They've been voted number one and number two best place to work in the city of Jacksonville. So two years in a row. The last two years of this company, they have experienced uh, revenues in the last two years that exceed the previous 25 years of the company combined. Whoa. Damn. They're expanding all over the country. Uh, They don't spend any money on recruiters anymore. You think back to the old days, right? You had to to pay recruiters to get people to work there. Employee turnover (laughs) is one of these hidden costs that's ungodly expensive. They have virtually no turnover now. And and their best recruiters are their own employees because they love working there. It, it's pretty obvious when you look at it that way, but it all shakes down to the bottom line. Remember, his job, the, the assignment that he was given by the board was not make this a place that people love. Yeah. His job was turn this freaking, no pun intended, ship around <laughs> and make us profitable, right? Yeah. That's the objective and that's how he did it. That's amazing. Okay, that's a, one of the greatest examples because it's in an industry where it would make sense to hold back the ship, right? It's in an industry where it would make sense, and I mean mathematically, um, that it wasn't a great place to work. It's just shipping. What's exciting about shipping? Like, right. So for that to be one of the examples where it became wildly more profitable, even if you had to sacrifice the first couple of ships at a loss in order to make this the culture, there's such a great lesson in there. Matter of fact, how many people listening right now have a business where they're cutting a corner here or they're they're cutting a corner there or they're looking the other way because it's going to cost them money to do something for that customer when in the long run, if they would make that sacrifice on the first few customers, then the business due to word of mouth would probably be flush with profit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I would hope that we're we're um, collectively getting closer to that understanding. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is is through, you know, the, the world that you and I live in, which is content mm-hmm. marketing, yep. right? Yep. So we know it's best practice now. You give you give stuff away. Mm-hmm. You give stuff away. That's how you build a relationship. Yep. And so what does that mean? You're spending time on developing things that you're not getting paid for. But what are you doing? You're building a relationship. You're, you're establishing your credibility. And then when you have something to sell, people want to buy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you should have something to sell. This is not... You know, I was talking to somebody today who does a lot of work with... She is a millennial, does a lot of work with millennials. And, and she finds this a lot in, um, she was saying, particularly up in Portland, Oregon, there's a lot of, a lot of tech startups and that kind of a thing, that, that these, um, these, these younger generation of business people are passionate about what they do. They have a sense of purpose. They want to make a difference. But a lot of them are really struggling with this idea of making money mm-hmm. because there's something that says, no, that's bad. If I make money, I'm compromising my purpose. It's the whole reason for this show. What's that? So that's the whole reason for this show, by the way. For the love of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so it's love and, it's money and purpose and passion. Mm-hmm. It's, it's all of the above. These are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Uh, I believe I said it. Uh, in fact, I remember I said it on your show because you wrote it up as a quote mm-hmm. from, our first, from our first conversation. You don't have to be an ass to make money. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a martyr to change the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do all of them, yeah. Uh, and that's that's a big it's a big part of the message of of this book. I love that. I love that. What's the most surprising lesson? Do you think as we read, love is just damn good business? As we're making our way through this book, what's going to shock us? I, this is a two a two sided answer. How simple this is, mm-hmm. 
and how hard it is. Mm. Uh, Why is it difficult? So it's difficult because, I mean, just think about this. If I'm coming from a position that says, I want my people to love working here. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm coming from a position that says, I love this business, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a responsibility to this business, particularly if I'm an entrepreneur or a senior executive or whatever, I have a fiduciary responsibility to this business. Plus, I need to get results. So I could love you Mm -hmm. and I could love this business. And it could become very clear to me that you are not right for this business. Mm -hmm. So if I love you, would I fire you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So love is, is, this is tough stuff. And, and there's not, there, there aren't any formulaic answers to, you know, how do you, how do you do this? You have to ask the the right questions. How can I better show that I love them? What, what am I willing to compromise and what am I not? Yeah. Uh, You know, where do I stand firm on my principles and my values and where do I bend? Mm -hmm. Um, These are, these are really, really deep questions. So I think people will find it surprising that it's not fluffy. For one thing. I guess I never thought of that or realized that, but sometimes the most loving things you can do are some of the the toughest, muddiest, roughest things that you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, no question about it. And so this is not love as a as a, you know, hearts and flowers, sentimental yeah. kind of a thing. This is love as a discipline and a practice. And that's what it takes. It takes discipline, it takes practice, it takes trial and error. It's a, which, in other words, it means you try something, it doesn't work, you fall on your face, you pick yourself up, you ask what you learned from it, and you try something new. Yeah. Why do you try something new? Because you love this place, because you love your customers, mm-hmm. because it's that's what makes it worth it. Yeah. Right. So it's really it's at the it's at the heart, it's at the foundation of of what great business is, because that's that's where you get your juice from. That's what gives you the reason to go on. And part of that reason, let's not forget is to make money. Mm-hmm. Unless you're in a nonprofit, even then you have to raise money. And then money, you need right? money. Yeah, you need to make money. Yeah, you money. have to raise money. But it's what, what's a, what becomes a problem is when you begin to sacrifice everything else for the money. And that comes from a, a deep misunderstanding of where the money comes from to begin with. Yes. Because you're, you're, you are hallucinating Mm-hmm. That the money is there because you're being brutal, for example. Yeah. No, it's there in spite of the fact that you're being mm-hmm. brutal. Yep. So you have a better way to do it that is going to feel better and it's going to make people more money, but it's not going to be easier. Oh, man, I love that. And that's so relevant to what we talk about. If I were to ask you who should read this book, of course, you could say everyone. But I want you to get really specific and talk to one particular person or genre or type of individual out there that may or may not grab this book, but they need to. Who is that? What a stupid question. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring that back <laughs> oh, around. Oh, I got point. that in. I feel so much better now. I've just been waiting. It's so timely for that too. <laughs> yeah. So if I had to choose, uh, I would say people who, who are either already in leadership positions or aspire to be. Mm. Uh, so I, I'll I'll say you know you you self select on that basis right mm-hmm. so what I don't mean by that is this is only for people who are in positional authority yeah so if you're the CEO of a company or an entrepreneur or, what, or whatever and, and and people report to you that doesn't automatically make you a leader but it should automatically make you desire to be a good one mm-hmm. right yep. so so for people who are in positional leadership this book is for them but also for people who aspire to lead from wherever they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, because leadership is not about your position or title, what that means is you don't need a position or title to have influence, to make a difference, to have an impact on the people around you. That's leadership. Mm-hmm. So I, I I love the idea of kind of hanging this whole thing on that discussion of leadership. And part of that's because that's my lens, man. I mean, that's what I've been focusing on for forever. Uh, so you're a leader, you aspire to lead, this book is for you. I love that. I love that. All right. Where can we get the book? When's it available? So it's available. This is good news. It's available a month ago. All right. That's great uh, yeah, news. So it's, out, it's been out for a month. We're getting really great response to it. So if you're uh, listening the, to this, that means that, yes, it can be in your hand. Yeah, that's right. And, well, depending on when you're listening to it, uh, maybe it was out a year ago. If well, you're listening to it this a year from now. But I mean, so it's still September, be available. September of 2019 was when it came out, to be specific. So you can find it, obviously, on Amazon. Uh, and if you would like to, uh, uh, to, to take a little bit of a self-assessment 
and see where your where your starting point is. If you go to loveisgoodbiz.com, mm-hmm. there is a, a self-assessment built around the LEAP framework, Love, Energy, Audacity, and Proof. It'll give you a good starting place. That's cool. I'm going to go take that. Loveisgoodbiz.com. Take that That's self-assessment. The place. Do you think it's going to... Am I going to have an eye-opening moment when I take that assessment? Like, whoa, I got stuff to work on? You're going to have to tell me. All right, I will. All right, that's fair. I will. Okay, last question. You answered this thing a couple of years ago. I'm curious how you answer it now. Give me a reason why people should be unapologetic about their pursuit of success. Yeah. Oh, man. I wish I had... Oh, hold on one second. Yeah. Hold on. Go grab hold it. On. Hold on. I'm going to... So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really presumptuous here. <laughs> this is great. I can't wait to see what's and, happening. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to quote myself. Yes, I love it. From the introduction to the book. By the way, by you quoting yourself out of your own book, you're being unapologetic. You're living the answer right now. Uh, yes, uh, th- that's right. And the, um, the title of the book is, is designed, of course, to be unapologetic. Uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to put it front and center. I just wanted to kind of, you know, this doesn't sound very loving, but, you know, smack you upside the head. <laughs> Oh, with love, it's 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 a punch so, with love. So now, now I'm uh, I'm I'm stumbling because I can't remember exactly where I said these words. <laughs> oh, here we go. My advice to you is this: says Steve Farber, that's me. <laughs> be totally unapologetic for the money you're earning. Be totally unapologetic for the joy you're experiencing. Be totally unapologetic for the impact you're making on the world for the better. But aspire to do all of them. That's what we're built to do, in my opinion. And that's at the very heart of why I believe love is just damn good business. Because love is the secret sauce that makes it all possible. Ah, I love that. One of the best answers ever on this show. So you already told us where to find the book. Where do we follow you? Uh, SteveFarber.com. And if you can remember my name, you can find me. F A R B E R. Very right. Easy. So on Instagram is Steve Farber, LinkedIn is Steve Farber, Facebook is Steve Farber, Twitter is Steve Farber. You, you get the you get the idea. Pretty easy to find you. I love it. I'm easy to find. Steve, I can't thank you enough for for taking some time out to be on the show a second time. I know how valuable it's your time pleasure. is, but you know you're one of those people that's out there doing it in terms of being a true professional author and making a great living doing it. And, and I really wanted to have that conversation for everyone else who's out there saying, hey, I've got a book in me. You know, Am I an author? Am I not? Should I do it or should I not? So thank you for your yeah. transparency, for your lessons, for your books, just for everything that you continue to, to give as a gift to this world. Thank you, Chris. It's been my great honor. Mm, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success. 